Well, can you join me in a word of prayer? Yes. Heavenly Father, Lord, we come before you thanking you. Thanking you, Lord, for loving on us the way that you do. Unconditional, unmerited favor. Lord God, giving us what we don't really deserve. That love that nurtures us from the head to toe type of love. Thank you, Father, for all that you are doing in our life. Father, thank you for, again, tolerating us with some of our mistakes and bad decisions, Lord, and never turning your back on us. Thank you, Father. Lord, I ask right now, as I stand before your people, that you would decrease me, Lord, and that you would increase in me through your Holy Spirit, and that your Spirit, Father, would touch the hearts and minds of your children here in this place. Yes. Father, we ask for the leading of your spirit to give us the truth that you have in your word and that we would not just retain it in our mind, but that we would actually live it out in our life, that we are a light in this dark world. I pray, Father, that you would have your way. Lord, right now we're asking that you would remove all distractions, cleanse our mind and our heart from the mess. Take it away right now that we can have a clear pathway to your word to our heart through these ears that you have given us. I pray, Father, for your will to be done this day and that you would be glorified in it. We pray this in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. 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 You guys got your handouts. I have a little excerpt uh, that I took from a book called Relentless Spirituality. It's uh, written by Gary Kiesling, and it breaks down the, the understandings of discipline spiritual discipline and this excerpt that I took says a lot so I, I want to read it to you guys if you don't mind is that alright? All right. okay here we go many Christians believe God wants to accomplish great things in the world some see a vision for what Christ longs to do in the hearts and lives of people living in darkness unfortunately few Precious few are willing to pay the price to move past familiar boundaries or comfortable surroundings for the sake of the gospel. Rare indeed are those who have the courage to make the sacrifices necessary to accomplish great things with the Lord. Two things that stood out to me when I read this and the first part was the few who are willing to pay the price for the gospel's sake. Pay the price of getting out of the comfort zone for the gospel's sake. Who are willing to do the necessary sacrifice so that they can do great things with the Lord. Sad to say is not many that are willing to go above and beyond and sacrifice. So then the question that I have to ask myself and everyone that are a part of the body of Christ, what's your agenda? In life, what are you living for? Who are you living for? Is it consisting of sacrifice and glorification to the Lord, your agenda? Or is it self-gratification to self? 
Well, in chapter 10 of 1 Corinthians, uh, Paul is going to give us the right agenda. The agenda that brings glory to the Lord. And I, I want to break it down a little bit. What's the problem with why we, the men, who are not willing to make the sacrifice? What's the problem? What causes us not to be willing to do it? And then the next thing that I'm going to identify is what's our true purpose? And then after that, let's put a plan together to execute it. That sounds good? Amen. All right. Well, if you guys could turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, we're going to finish chapter 10 starting at verse 23 and end at verse 1 of chapter 11. Is everybody there? Y'all yes, beat me to it, huh? Good deal. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are beneficial or helpful. All things are lawful for me, but not all things edify. Let no one seek his own, but each one the other's well-being. Eat whatever is sold in a meat market, asking no questions for conscience sake. For the earth is the Lord's and all its fullness. If any of those who do not believe invite you to dinner and you desire to go, eat whatever is set before you, asking no question for conscience sake. But if anyone says to you, this was offered to idols, do not eat it for the sake of the one who told you and for conscience sake. For the earth is the Lord's and all its fullness. Conscious, I say, not your own, but that of the other. But why is my liberty judged by another man's conscience? But if I partake with thanks, why am I evil spoken of for the food over which I give thanks? Therefore, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Give no offense either to the Jews or to the Greeks or to the church of God, just as I also please all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of many that they may be saved. Imitate me, just as I also imitate Christ. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading and hearing of his word. Paul says a mouthful, amen? amen. Let's look at verse 23. Because we, we know the thing, we, we've been talking about it for a minute, that uh, we don't have the liberty to do what we want to do if we're called to love one another. We are called to love one another and to give unto one another above ourselves. That's what we're supposed to do. So we can't just, just do anything. Amen. We'll be held accountable for what we do, right? So we know that we've been freed by our faith in Christ, but we still have to be careful with the things that we do yes. because other people are looking, other people are watching what we say and what we do, and we just don't have that luxury, right? Amen. Problem I have found in verse 23 in the comment the slogan that was said, all things are lawful for me. I have the right to do anything. I'm going to ask this question. Does it sound like it's a little bit of arrogance in that tone? Yeah. Yeah. Arrogance, right? Pride, right? 
that I can do whatever I want to do. So that's selfish ambition, right? We agree. Those are issues that I believe keep us away from having the right agenda. And guess what? We all suffer from it. All of us. I don't think you're human if you don't. Because we grew up <laughs> all about me, right. right? The baby, I want my milk. <laughs> and I'm going to cry until you give me my milk, right? So it's all about me. So first point I'd like to share is mature believers must cease from hiding their true selves from each other. I think it's good for us to be real with one another. All right. We're not perfect, and that we don't have it all together, and that we have issues that only God can correct. Amen. But we have to allow God to do it, right? Amen. They, we, I must determine in my heart to face my issues and then repent. And these issues consist of pride, arrogance, and selfish ambition. So why do we need to repent? Because God told us to. <coughs> repent and perish. Right? But in the next point, is it not wise to be the one? It is not wise to be the one that God opposes. Like in last, well, it's in this section in, in, in chapter 10. He says, are you stronger than God? You know, are, are you that bold to do you and then face God? Like, that's not wise. You know, and the word oppose, it means to range a battle against. God ranges a battle against the proud. You're not going to win. It's not going to go down. So if we see that we have pride, what do we need to do? Repent. If we see that we hold arrogance in, what do we need to do? Repent. If we see that our game plan is to do self, repent. Because if not, we're going to come up against God. And God says, you will be humble. I mean, I don't think that humbling <laughs> is a comfortable right. place to be. I, I'd rather humble myself. Right. <laughs> right. 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 I'm not going to mess around. Okay. Right? <laughs> if you don't repent, you will find it impossible to seek the well-being of others. Right? Because we're still going to be focused on doing what we want to do. We're not going to be concerned about anybody else. Repenting, we agree with God that we're wrong in our behavior. That it doesn't please God to do what we're doing. Because God created us for ourselves. No, he created us for him. For him. So God has equipped us to do work for ourselves. No, for him. And if that's not our agenda, then we're in trouble. Because God says that he wants us to worship him and him alone. To give our life to him and him alone. Amen? Amen. So all things are lawful for me. I wanted to know, where did they get this from? This saying... You know, he's talking to the believers. So they're either coming from the word of God, right? That you're now set free. Those who are in Christ are set free, right? Or they could be talking about the philosophy that was in that time called Gnostics. That this group of people, they taught that your virtue comes from your secret knowledge of 
who God is. But we found that out in Christ, right? What these groups didn't understand that God would come in the filthy flesh of human beings that he couldn't have been God. So God must be spirit, and knowledge is the closest thing to spirit, so we're going to follow that. And they said this body is going to be done away with. So you don't have to be worried about what you do in the body because it's the spirit that enters into heaven. So have your way. And those individuals were called hedonists. They indulged themselves in sexual immorality. They they indulged themselves in the flesh. But then you had the opposites. They were the ascetics. And they were the ones that knew the flesh was so foul that they didn't want to indulge the flesh at all. They abstained from everything. And that's why Paul, when he says, eat whatever, he's kind of addressing that, you know, your way of thinking, your way of being in this ascetic lifestyle. He even said it earlier. He said, uh, what you do eat, well, what you don't eat won't draw you closer to God nor pull you further away from God. So why waste your time? And we got a lot of people that still like that today, even in the body of Christ. They're so concerned about because they're trying to get right with the Lord. This is how we get right with the Lord. Allowing it to move from here to here. That's how. In our faith. And then we don't have to worry about what we eat or don't eat. That make sense? Yeah. All right. Section B in the first portion, it says, who or what are we truly living for? Now, these are questions that I ask, and you can fill it out. But at the end, it should give us an idea of ourselves. I think the key to our Christian living is knowing who we are, knowing ourselves to the point where we know what traps us and what encourages us. The more we know about ourselves, the better we can line up with the Word of God. That makes sense? All right, so ask your heart. What would you rather have than anything else in the world? And you put your answer down. What do you think about most of the time? Most of the time. What do you do with your free time? This is going to give us an idea of who we are and what we do and what type of agenda we already have in plan. That makes sense? Yes. Let us see. Remember, we were called to live in freedom. But don't use this freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but serve one another through love. Verse 25, I mean 24, it says, Let no one seek his own but each one the other's well-being. That should be the gist of our agenda, is that we don't seek our own, but that we seek the well-being of others more than ourselves, Paul said in Philippians, that we would do above for others than ourselves. And that, I know it's a challenge for us, because of our selfishness, because of our pride, that we will get distracted on doing what we want to do, not thinking of others. And to those who do think of others more than themselves, praise God that you have gotten there and help the rest of us get there. Pray for us. I'm not saying that it's okay for us not to want to be able to do for others more than ourselves. It's not okay not to. 
but it's hard. It's hard to get our mind on living for the Lord. Because when we are focused on living for the Lord, there's no way that we can miss out on helping other people, or serving them before ourselves. So the question then, how do you do that? Paul talking to the Corinthians, he's asking them to plead. Well, I take that back. He's not asking. He's telling them. Let no one seek his own, but each one the other's well-being. How do you do that? He says, I'm going to give you the example. 25 to 29. Eat whatever is sold in the marketplace, asking no questions for conscience sake, for the earth is the Lord's. And just to sum it up, he says, but if you come across a situation where somebody, a non-believer, invites you over to have dinner, he said, if you want to go, go. Enjoy yourself. Don't worry about what the food is, if it's been offered to idols. Don't worry about it. Just enjoy it. Eat it. Don't investigate. Enjoy your time. I think Solomon said the best thing that you could do is eat, drink, be merry. Right? And do with your hands. Right? He said that, right? <laughs> but don't be so concerned about where that food comes from. I think Jesus said it real good, too. He said, don't worry about what you put in. Be concerned about what comes out. That's what defiles you, not what you take in. But he says, enjoy your time, right? He said, but now, if this one individual might be a weaker brother, if he comes and he says, hey, you, uh, you, you know that steak, that juicy, succulent, Stay. You haven't eaten all day. You know it's been off of the idols, and you hungry. You know what I mean? Because you know that they cook good barbecue, good food, and they say, you know, this food been off of the idols. So what you think? Now I can tell you what I think. You need to mind your own business. <laughs> Right? But I know that that's not what the Word of God says, right? And that's not what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to seek the well-being of others more than ourselves. So what does Paul say? Don't eat it. I don't care how hungry we are. You know that it doesn't mean anything. But for him, that's sad. Don't do it because he's brought it to your attention. Now it's your responsibility to love this person sacrificially dying yourself. And that's hard. That is hard. That is hard because there's some things that we like to do. And when somebody come and check us on it, you know, we'll be quick to be like, what? <laughs> you know, you need to stop being legalist. <laughs> Uh, 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 legalistic, you know. Yeah, but if that is hindering this individual's personal walk with the Lord. Yes. And because he says this, he says, you don't do it because of your conscience. You do it for this person's conscience and for him because he could sin, right, in the flesh and then confuse his mind with what he thinks. Now we know that when we have the word of God that we should be solid. But if we are not careful with what we allow to influence our mind, we can get confused too. So we have to be careful what we listen to, careful what we watch, careful where we go because the enemy will use those areas to throw confusion in the mix of our walk with the Lord to have us uncertain and then what we do causes other people to go astray. I know that's not on the outline, but that's truth though, mm -hmm. right? So, the earth is the Lord's 
in all its fullness and conscience sake. It repeats itself several times, so I just want to emphasize it's important what we do for our mind. You know, the Word of God tells us that we are supposed to guard our mind and our heart, which comes through praying, right? He said, don't be anxious for nothing, but in everything with prayer and supplication, present your request, right? So we shouldn't do nothing without the Lord's involvement and him telling us what we should do no matter how small it might be. All right. The Lord's, the earth is the Lord's in all its fullness. It's a reminder from Psalms 24 that everything that exists is from the Lord. That's the confidence that we have that it's all right. Your body is all right. Not, I don't want to talk about what's true, right? We all have some form of illness or whatnot. But God created that body and God is the one who is able to cure it. And we can trust that because we are his creation, that he has the answer. And all we need to do is scuff our knees up and go before him for that comfort, for that strength, for that building up because it all dwells with him. That makes sense? A little off, but let's keep on moving. Verse 29, conscience, I say, not your own, but that of the other. For why is my liberty judged by another man's conscience? But if I partake with thanks, why am I evil spoken of? Real quick, when I read this, I was a little confused because it seemed like it said two different things, right? It said, don't worry about what to eat, but if somebody says it's off of the idols, don't eat it, and then it has this. But if I partake with thanks, why am I evil spoken of for the food of which I give thanks? Like, whoa, hold on. Paul already anticipated our feelings about when we can't do what we want to do. You know, because I would relate with this individual. He says, hold on, why is my liberty judged by another man's conscience? He needs to grow up. He needs to mature and get over it. Right? But that is where God is saying, this is where you need to sacrifice. This is where you need to put that individual above yourself. Amen. And then he says, look, to sum it all, therefore, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all for the glory of God. Yes. Identify your purpose. And it's right there. Mature believers must recognize their purpose and pursue it. With spiritual discipline, we're in section two. He says, whatever you do, whether you eat, whether you drink, whatever you do, do all to the glory of who? God. God. That's the bottom line. Regardless of what you want, do it for the glory of God. And, you know, so does that mean anything? No. Anything that doesn't have a non-moral situation you can do, but will it build up? Will it benefit others? Those are the things that you do. Will they build up? Will they build you up? Will they build up your brother? Those are the things that you do. If you choose not to do those things, then now you're going against the Lord. Our purpose is to glorify God, letter A, in everything that we do in our sacrificial love towards God and one another. Giving 100% of our heart, mind, soul, and strength to them. This is what edifies the body of Christ. And that should be our agenda, is to edify 
the body of Christ. Point one. There must be relentless obedience to the word of God. Do nothing out of selfish ambition, letter A, but in humility, value others above yourself. That's our purpose. And the word of God is useful for teaching, correcting, and training in righteousness. That's how we know how to love on our brothers and sisters sacrificially, agape o love, love in action, willing to give of self for the betterment of our brothers and sisters. That's supposed to be our agenda. That make sense? We must be careful not to practice legalism, which is devotion to rules as the standard for salvation. Right? Like Paul had said earlier. You know, it's not about what you eat and if you do or don't eat it. It's not going to make you any better with the Lord. He said, but practice a spirit-led life through faith in Christ. Amen? Amen. We need a spirit-led life so that we are not anxious about nothing. You know, and being concerned about our conscience to the point where we are living out the word of God. Allowing the word of God to saturate us so that we are living the word of God. I know when we ask that question, what do we do in our spare time? Are we saturating ourselves with the word of God? Are we making that time to do that? Because that's going to help us in having the right agenda. Amen? That's the purpose. We need a spirit-led life so that our lives won't bring a reproach to God or to the body of Christ, hindering others from receiving salvation. All right. Last part. Imitate me, just as I also imitate Christ. Paul says in 32, give no offense either to the Jews or to the Greeks or to the church of God, just as I also please all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of many, that they may be saved. <clears throat> Paul says, I'm going to do whatever I can to make certain that you come to know Christ in a personal way. Is that our agenda? That I will please all. The idea is not compromising. The idea is getting you from not knowing the Lord to knowing the Lord through his life. He says, so follow me as I follow Christ. That's a strong statement, but that's our plan, to follow Christ, right? Jesus made it very clear. He said, if you choose to follow me, there are some things that you're going to have to do. You have to die to yourself. And then you're going to have to take up your cross. So that means that you are dead to this world from now on. That this world doesn't tempt you and bring you away from the will of God because you're dead to it. Then he says, follow me. Right? I don't know about you. I'm stuck at dying itself. <laughs> Only God can give me the strength to get past that. Only God. I can't come up with no formula to die to self other than to surrender Amen. and fall at his feet and say, Lord, I can't do this. I can't do this. You have to do this, and I'm willing. I'm here, Lord. And then have him to do the rest. Die to self. Take up the cross and follow, right? 
section three. Mature believers must imitate Christ and follow him relentlessly in every aspect of their lives, moment by moment. We must commit to Luke 9, 23, where we just went over, and Romans 6, 12 through 13, where it says, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. The problem is our pride. We need to repent of it. We have a purpose and that is to do everything for the glory of God. Yes. And we have a plan and that is to follow Christ. Paul said, imitate God. Do everything as you imitate God. And he says, follow the example that Christ left, that he gave himself. He offered himself as a sacrifice for you, a pleasing aroma to the Lord. Let that be our life. Amen? Amen. 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 Therefore, whatever you do, do, whether in word or deed, do it all for the glory of God. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, that you have shown us through your word what our agenda should be. Help us, O oh Lord, to stick to this plan that you have given us, Lord. Help us, Father, to resist the devil as we submit to you, Lord. Help us, Father, to hear only you, Lord, and not our flesh and not the enemy. That we would only be focused on you, Lord, in everything that we do. That you would be glorified and that your church, the body of Christ, will be edified. And Lord, we know that you will follow through with being faithful to us, Lord. You are a sovereign God, knowing the end from the beginning. You know our hearts. You know what we are going through. So Father, even right now, I'm praying for everyone that is here, that we even Commit ourselves today to live more for you. Mm. That those who have called upon your name that know you as Lord, that we would surrender more of our life, that we would give 100% of our heart to you, our mind to you, our soul to you, Father, that we would be ready, ready, willing, and available, Lord, to serve you for your kingdom and not to serve ourselves. This is for the body of Christ, Lord. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.